Record Store Nation. Oh my goodness, it feels like it's been forever since we've done an episode, but we are back. And before we go on, of course, we have to thank The Stew with our opening song there. We always appreciate when The Stew stops by and sits in with us to give us our opening music. So thank you so much for listening to The Record Store. Um, Took a few weeks off. I guess actually it wasn't that long, but we did some traveling. And when I say we, of course, I mean me. But, you know, it's because us podcasters, we have weird uh, psychological bullshit where we think we're more than one person or something. I don't know. Anyway... Uh, no, actually, I did travel with my best friend, John. So I can say we and have it actually be official. So took some time off in August and I'm back. It's the fall, you know, pumpkin spice latte season and everything is pumpkin these days. So why can't they do like more maple and more cinnamon? I have nothing against pumpkin. I really do love pumpkin stuff, but man, they just overdo it. So it needs to be more cinnamon and more maple. That's what I got to say. And caramel apple, that's another good one. So do some more of that, Starbucks and all you other people that just do pumpkin stuff. I mean, I grant you that's going to sell. Oreos, you know, that's going to sell. But bring out some more stuff. Anyway, getting off track already. So get it, track, music, podcast. Anyway, uh, so this is the record store. And you know the concept is I grab, I randomly grab an album off my wall of CDs. And I just... I'm able to listen to it with a fresh set of ears. Maybe it's something that I haven't listened to in decades. Maybe it's something that is brand new. Who knows? Uh, the only things that I try to avoid are greatest hits albums um, or other weird albums that just don't make sense. Or if I just did a band, if I did an episode and did the same band, like happened to grab an album by the same band a couple weeks later. So I'm not going to do that. So anyway, this is our first episode of the fall, and I'm very excited because, God, it just hit me as I was putting this together today how much music really does mean to me. And, you know, I always joke about the book, All the Right Notes on Amazon, um, but it just, in reading the book, you will probably, hopefully, um, I've been told I'm a good storyteller, so hopefully that's true and it's not just somebody blowing smoke, but hopefully in reading the book and hearing me talk about music on here, you realize how much music does mean to me and it really does just, it's the soundtrack of my life and that's such a cliche, I guess, but it really is. So the concept of the record store, as we've done before for the last year plus, is just grabbing an album, listening to it with a fresh set of ears, and talking about it, and talking about the artist, and talking about what that album has meant to me personally, or that artist has meant to me personally. So really excited. Uh, Today I grabbed a John Waite album, and it's called Temple Bar. It was his fifth studio album, fifth solo album. Um, John Waite is one of those guys that just so massively flies under the radar, um, just, but yet one of my all time favorite male vocalists, just such a great voice. And I've been a fan of his since the beginning. It was like the late seventies, I want to say when I discovered the babies. So he was the lead singer of the babies, uh, did some solo stuff. And then also, then he joined the super group, uh, bad English. Um, so there's been basically three kind of different eras for him, although bad English and the babies were not too different. Um, but just like I said, a little-known guy, but Missing You is obviously the big hit the, that's been covered many, many times, and you've heard his version of it many, many times. Probably in every grocery store you've ever been in, you'll hear Missing You. Um, but it's just such a beautiful song, and honestly, it's in my top ten of favorite songs of all time. It's just such a classic, simple love song, you know, and I just I love that song Missing You. And I was already a big fan of his before that came out. Like I said, I go back all the way to the late 70s with the babies with him. And when people express that they don't know who John Waite is or younger fans don't know, have never heard of John Waite. And then most people do recognize as soon as you say Missing You, they're like, oh, yeah, that guy. okay." But that's like one of the only songs they know by him. But he does have other hits. And we're going to talk about that. But when I have to make the comparison of like, who would I compare John Waite to? My go-to, for better or worse, my go-to is always Rod Stewart because they both represent that Cockney British, you know, but they get they can do rockers and they can do ballads. Um, but I find, like, John Waite is less polarizing than Rod Stewart. Like, usually when I mention Rod Stewart, people are like, eh, or, or they really like him. Uh, but it's very hit or miss with Rod Stewart. Whereas with John Waite, the people who realize who John Waite is and some of the songs he's done – a lot less polarizing, and there's probably a lot more appreciation of John Waite. You just don't 
those songs, you know, some of those famous songs that he's had just don't immediately come to mind other than Missing You. So um, for the record, John Waite just turned 70. I looked that up today. Just turned 70. I've seen him a handful of times, um, obviously at very small clubs. It's not like you're going to see John Waite performing at Soldier Field or something. So unless he's on a bill where, you know, there's like seven other acts or something. But um, I've always loved the intimacy of seeing John Waite in a small club, which is awesome. Uh, lots of hits. I'm sorry, but lots of hits. When I was researching this, I feel like I have to mention, isn't it time? And every time I think of you were the babies. Those were two big hits with the babies. Then change. And of course, missing you as part of his solo career. Uh, and then as in part of bad English, when I see you smile, that was probably the other most well-known hit in terms of like from a classic rock standpoint that you would have heard on the radio. So when I see you smile is definitely something that you'll steer, still hear on classic rock radio these days. So this album that we're going to talk about today is called Temple Bar. Like I said, it was his fifth studio album, came out in 1995. Um, he has had 10 solo albums. Um, what's interesting is that from this album on, from number five on, none of them charted. So, you know, I always talk about, you know, this did, uh, you know, place 17th in the Netherlands and 12th in Japan and so on. But none of these albums charted. So it just kind of shows that, that's how far off the radar John Waite has been since basically 1995. So over the last over 25 years plus is that John Waite has not charted. Um, his most recent uh, studio album was in 2011, uh, but there have been some compilations that I've actually picked up. Uh, he's done a couple, a compilation, like a really big compilation of a lot of his songs done acoustically. Um, so that was a really nice, I think it was a three disc set that came out a couple years ago. Um, so some really good stuff. And like I said, just the fact that it's been under the radar, like I even have missed some of these albums because as much as I like him and I'm a fan of his, I didn't even know that some of these albums came out in the two thousands. So I am going to use this today as a launching point to make sure I go back and get some of those albums from the two thousands that I'm missing. Um, he left bad English in 1991. You know, he had it, very, um, I guess different aspects of his career. You know, he was part of the babies. That was a young band starting out the wild British guys in the, in the seventies into the eighties. Uh, and then did some solo stuff and then did bad English in 1991 or left bad English rather in 1991, um, decided he wanted to focus exclusively on his solo stuff. And he felt that doing fitting into the parameters of the rock band was killing his personal vision of what he wanted his music to be. He wanted to stop selling out, I guess, if, it, if that's a way you want to put it. Um, and he wanted to focus exclusively on his type of music and, and his vision of music. So um, he was, he had just gotten divorced too. That was another big thing in his life that had happened right around that time. So he left Ben English, got divorced, and then he was very happy returning to what his original roots were and what made his love for music. And so this became a very personal album. Temple Bar became a very personal album. Um, I did not have it when it came out. I didn't, I didn't even know it existed. And that's exactly, you know, a function of the fact that he didn't, he wasn't getting airplay. Um, he had completely kind of flown under the radar after leaving um, Bad English. So I didn't even know it was here. So I, or I didn't even know it was out at the time. I know I picked it up Years ago, I picked it up used, and I can tell that it's used because I still see like some scotch tape on this CD holding it closed. So it's like I definitely picked it up used. I usually don't pick things up used unless it's an extremely rare, um, something that I can't find anywhere else new. Um, not that I'm afraid I'm going to get cooties or monkey pox or anything from used albums, but speaking of used albums... Um, the, the road trip that we took earlier in August, uh, we went to Nashville, and thanks to Richard Mulliken of P3 Radio, uh, he told me about McKay's Bookstore, which was this used book and music store, basically. But this thing, I've never seen a store like this. It, it was like basically the size of a grocery store. I think that either it was a grocery store at one time, or it could have been like, I don't know, it might have been a public library, although it was in like a strip mall kind of setting. So I doubt it was a public library. But this place was enormous and it had two floors. It was really bizarre. It had like the music was on the second floor, uh, both CDs and vinyl. Uh, and then on the first floor, it was like mainly DVDs and books. And just I think there was even actually VHS tapes, too, and Funko Pops and 
all this crazy and it was in good shape most of the stuff was in really good shape um i usually don't go to use to like resale shops or or thrift stores or stuff like that because i always feel like i need to take a shower after i leave those places but um this place was amazing and i did find some rarities there i found a cars rarity there and i found a donna summer i know donna summer kind of out of left field for me but i love the donna summer hits so i found a couple really rare cds there and so i had to pick them up and i'm really glad thank you richard for turning on turning me on to this place because it really was a very cool atmosphere and my buddy and i john were there for we had to be there at least for over an hour looking for stuff so i found a couple good finds um and but yet Temple Bar by John Waite, I did not find there. Um, I didn't see any John Waite stuff there that I didn't already have. So the this one, I think I got it. I must have gotten it used on Amazon or eBay or something because, like I said, just seeing the scotch tape on it tells me that it was used. So, But in very good shape. So anyway, all right, back to the album. So the album came out in 95. Um, it was his fifth out of 10 solo albums. So I'm going to go back and make sure I got some of those other ones that came out after this that also did not chart because there is no God, apparently. Uh, there's no justice. Let's put it that way. For you religious types, there's no justice. So, But the album was well received. Um, what's interesting is that the critics liked it and they hated Bad English. So I guess they must have viewed Bad English as being very by the book, and very by the numbers and you know just straight ahead rock that had nothing creative about it so the critics did not like bad english so they looked at this album as a return of john Waite, the return of the music of john Waite. so i think this was very well received um because of that they just the dislike of bad english was there i liked bad english they only did like one or two albums but i like those guys but i guess i can see what the critics are saying because he was definitely pigeonholed into that hard rock um just stereotype i guess by doing that music and doing the baby so but you know what honestly i like both sides of john Waite. i like when he does his own stuff um he does he tends to do more ballads and more low-key stuff when he's recording uh but i like the hard rock and john Waite too so we'll get into that so this album uh just a plain white cover that just says john Waite temple bar on the front of it think of uh the beetle the beatles white album that's about how no frills this is there is a picture of him on the back uh and there's a couple pictures inside but there are lyrics so of course that's a good thing uh and especially because of the fact that there was um you know the concept here is that he he's coming out of a rough emotional time and had just come out of his divorce and how personal this album was so it's good that the lyrics were there uh it's mostly all written by him there's a couple covers that we're going to talk about which are really interesting selections so in looking over the musicians that are on here none of the names really stand out there's nothing nobody on here that is like oh look that guy's on here there's nobody like that i'm sure these are just pretty much session musicians that he's worked with in the past so you could tell that um he's he was distancing weight was distancing himself from the former band members here he didn't have anybody from um bad english playing here and no well-known musicians like jonathan kane uh that was with him in bad english that went on to journey afterwards um there or in um uh the babies too so i mean there's no famous names of people that he worked with so it's all just kind of I don't want to say generic, but session musicians that you would not know by name. So, um, like I said, it's it's just clear and obvious that he wanted to get away from the whole bad English experience. So it must have been a bad experience for him. I don't know. Uh, I Like I said, what I heard of the couple albums they did, I liked. So anyway, this has uh, Temple Bar has 10 songs, clocks in at about 43 minutes. So by my math, that's about four and a half minutes per song. Uh, I did that in my head. Uh, very much an ad lib, so... Thank you. Uh, anyway, so first song is called How Did I Get By Without You? Um, instantly recognizable John Waite sound. Uh, the very appealing British voice. Uh, this song is a very Missing You kind of vibe to it. Uh, could have been a big single in different times. You know, if radio had been a different beast at that time when this came out, uh, I think at that point, radio, rock radio was already starting to, to vanish. Uh, but could have been a big hit could have been the follow-up to missing you for sure just a how did i get by without you a pleasant love song uh really draws you in it's just a really simple riff just a really simple message and it's just a really pleasant song nothing to say bad about this song um it must have been you know in talking in looking at some of the notes about this album you know that this was uh him coming out of the divorce uh it, this must have been how he felt 
about his ex early on, you know, because it's very much a love song. Um, it, it's he literally, how did I get by without you? You know, it's a very simple message. Um, it really is a good song. Uh, one of the highlights on the album it starts the album out really strong and it really defines the ballad side of John Waite. So really good song to open the album up. So second song is called Someone Like You. It is the first of the covers that he does on here. Like I said, there's three covers. This one is a Van Morrison cover. I am not a Van Morrison fan per se, but I'm not a Van Morrison hater either. I don't know a ton of his stuff other than the the radio hits, you know, the 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 Van Morrison hits that everybody's heard a million times. So I'm not a like I said, I could kind of take it or leave it. I know that people that like Van Morrison just love Van Morrison and he's like their god, you know. I don't have anything against him, but he just never appealed to me. So, uh, But he wrote this song. I had never heard it before. I never heard a Van Morrison version of it. I'm sure there's people that can tell me, oh, yeah, that was on his third album, and it was the seventh track on the third album or whatever, because there are people that are obsessed with Van Morrison, not me. Anyway, um, it's a message of love and appreciation. Um, it fits in with the John Waite catalog, Um but it doesn't fit the divorce theme. Again, I think that this song, Someone Like You, he's very praising here. Uh, it's an even more simple song than the first song. It's a total ballad. you know. So after two songs, for one, I'm like, okay, he's pining for the ex-wife maybe? Or he's singing of the appreciation with the ex-wife? I'm not sure. Uh, but also, again, the other thing I was going to say after two songs is that I'm ready for John Waite to cut loose. I need some John Waite vocals. You know, I need some rock John Waite coming out of this. I do, like I said, don't get me wrong. I like the ballad John Waite. I like the mellow John Waite. But I need some rocking too. So you got to give me that. So anyway, um, it does not sway me. This song does not sway me about Van Morrison either, pro or con, as a performer or as a writer. It's it, Again, this song is just kind of there. It sounds good because it's John Waite's voice singing it. Uh, but it again, it doesn't. I don't come out of this song listening to it now in 2022 saying, oh yeah, John Mo- or uh, Van Morrison, what a great act. Nope, still still kind of there on John, Mor- on John Morrison. Why do I keep saying that? Van Morrison. So, all right, third song is called The Price of My Tears. Uh, It starts with drums. Drums launch into it, so it starts a bit more rocking, which I appreciate. Uh, It's a good start to the song, and after the two ballads, it was much needed. Um, In this song, Price of My Tears, he's blasting lawyers. So I'm like, okay, here we go. Now we're getting into the divorce because he starts blasting lawyers. So it's a weird song. Um, he He sings about a TV show that he's watching in a hotel that just makes him angry. Not sure what that's about. So this is where he's starting to get emotional and pass the divorce, I would say. Uh, better song than the last song. Better song than the John Morrison song. And a little bit bitter, too. Not just better, but bitter. So this is where you can tell that it's starting to get more personal and it's starting to get into the ugliness of the divorce, probably. So third song, Price of My Tears. Uh, better and improvement over the Van Morrison song and just also kind of on the bitter side. So, all right, fourth song is the next cover on the album. It is Ain't No Sunshine. It's the Bill Withers cover. Uh, Very familiar song. Um, It definitely keeps the sadness going from the last song, Price of My Tears. It keeps the sadness going from that. Um, He adds some really haunting guitars and drums, and he takes this song that is instantly recognizable and very um, you very well-known song, Ain't No Sunshine, everybody knows that song, um, and he adds this haunting element to it in the production, so it's a really, really good version. Uh, I know Bill Withers is no longer with us, he died in 2020, uh, but I would say when this came out, I would be willing to bet that Bill Withers approved of this version and and really enjoyed this version. I'm sure he was okay with it. Um, This is a cover where the singer's voice, and I I was not at all a Bill Withers hater or anything like that. It was a good song. He had a great career. Uh, But this is a cover where the singer's voice just absolutely matches the material. So the John Waite voice, I should say. Um, matches the material so well and actually improves on it. Um, Ain't No Sunshine, good song, emotional song in the first place, but Waite's version of it just improves on it greatly. And again, nothing against Bill Withers, uh, but Waite just absolutely kills this song. Uh, I love the arrangement of this song. I love the production of this song. Um, He just literally, you know, it's a cliche, but he takes this song and makes it his own. So Ain't No Sunshine at the fourth spot, just a fantastic version of it. So, and then the fifth song is called Downtown. It's a piano ballad. Um, 
from the very beginning of it, it sounds like something out of Born to Run. It sounds like from that Springsteen era of Born to Run or Darkness on the Edge of Town. It's that really crisp and clean piano beginning to it. Uh, a sad song. Downtown is a sad song. He's despondent here. So again, you start to hear the emotions coming out in him. Um, he says he used to be someone. He asks, do you remember me? Uh, now he sings in a place called Temple Bar, which is a bar and obviously the name of the album. So he even references that he was the guy that did that song that you know from 83, um, referring to Missing You. So it's very he's very down on himself here. Um, it's just a it's sad, kind of depressing song. So you could tell he's in his head. This is like in the throes of the divorce, probably, where he's really upset with everything and and down on himself. And the fact that he refers to the song, you know, I'm the guy who did that song in 83. So it gets a little bit upbeat. There's a little bit upbeat acoustic guitar and piano. It increasingly gets a little bit upbeat as it goes on, as it progresses. So maybe it shows that, you know, he's hit rock bottom at the beginning of the song and will rebound. You know, I mean, as it starts to get a little bit more up tempo as the song goes on. So Downtown, a really good song in the fifth spot on the album. And we are going to take a break. We're going to pay some bills. We're going to go make some ramen soup. And we're going to be back after these words from our sponsors. And we're going to cover the second half of Temple Bar by the enormously talented John Waite. Be right back, guys. All right, we are back with side two of Temple Bar by the enormously talented John Waite. Such a big fan of John Waite. So welcome back to the record store. Thank you guys for supporting our sponsors. Make sure you order shirts, buy the booze, buy the, you know, the pills, whatever. Uh, but whatever we're support, whatever our sponsors, whoever our sponsors are right now, please support them, and that helps us keep the lights on in the studios here. So uh, back to Temple Bar, uh, a very little-known John Waite album. John Waite, of course, as we've mentioned, formerly of The Babies, formerly of Bad English, and formerly of Missing You fame, which he sadly sang about in Downtown, the, the last song we covered before the break. So, all right, so back to side two. Uh, the sixth song is called In God's Shadow. Uh, it opens with a country guitar, like a very twangy country guitar. And again, this is where you can really see that John Waite did not like being um, stuck in the parameters of being in a rock band because he has, there's a couple of songs here that sound kind of country-ish, and he's done some country stuff in the past. So um, starts with the country guitar. Uh, many mentions here of the bottom of a glass, you know, in very in other John Waite songs too. I've heard him sing it at the bottom of a glass. So obviously it's uh, reinforcing the stereotype that British are hard drinkers because John Waite, John Waite refers to it a number of times, including in this song. So he, it, like I said, it just clearly feels that he felt pigeonholed in the bands and that he wanted to do these mellower kind of songs. And, you know, this is his wheelhouse, being able to do these ballad -y kind of songs with a country vibe to him. You know, he did some bluesy stuff too here and there. Uh, but you can just tell he, you know, he, yet while he excelled at the rock and roll songs, for sure, he liked doing this stuff too. So he's an adept singer. John Waite, to me, a very adept singer. He can really do both styles readily. Um, the, the ballads and the up-tempo and the hard rock, harder rock stuff. Um, so this song, In God's Shadow, is about the contradiction of a, a religious man who is out on Bourbon Street for the evening. So I don't know, this kind of out of left field in terms of the divorce and stuff. Maybe he was out drinking heavily because he was getting divorced and he was upset. Who knows? So he does you know a handful of religious quotes in the song and then it mentions towards the end that he's out on Bourbon Street. So... Interesting song uh, showing the different uh, sides of John Waite, at, at least at this time. So, all right. Seventh song is I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. Sounds familiar, right? Because you've heard it a million times. So it's a Hank Williams cover. Uh, this is another one of the covers that he did on this album. So I looked it up, and I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry has been covered at least 52 times. So, including, the, obviously, this one. So... Some of the names that you'd be familiar with. Elvis is the big one, obviously. That's the one everybody seems to be able to. When you hear that song title, you think of Elvis. So it's a Hank Williams song. He did it. Hank Williams Jr. also did it. Al Green, Chris Isaac, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, uh, Linda Carter. What the hell was that? Do, does anybody remember Linda Carter, w uh, Wonder Woman, actually releasing albums? So... Anyway, Linda Carter did the song and Glenn Campbell. Those are the big names that I found. And now John Waite. So as of 1995, John Waite did it too. So it stays very true. The um, 
the the production of it stays very true to the original it's a very bluegrass open to the song uh it stays true to that throughout the entire song it's not like wait was going to take it like what he did with uh, ain't no sunshine and create a completely different song or a different vibe to it so it's literally just wait it's a very bluegrassy country kind of sound to it um it's weight and a dobro, which I tried to look that up to see. Is that like a type of banjo or something? Because, I mean, I've seen that in, in credits many times. It's not. It sounds kind of like a banjo, but a little bit different. But it's literally him and it's it, him and the dobro, which is a, a guitarist was playing, which is a very old school guitar. Um, it's a, a thin wooden guitar that has like a metal, a round metal plate in the middle of it. So... I think you'd probably recognize it if you saw it, but it's something that I always I would always see that that word in credits, and I never bothered to look up what kind of guitar is that. So um, obviously, I'm so lonesome I could cry is chosen because of the divorce. Obviously, um, just like the Weather song was chosen because of the divorce. So um, it feels like you know, in talking about the covers that he chose, very deliberately chose these couple of covers. It seems like in looking at the progression they span the course of the relationship. You know, it starts with the Van Morrison song where he's saying, you know, someone like you, and he's saying, he's talking about the the woman in very positive terms. Uh, that's when things were good, obviously. And then it gets to Ain't No Sunshine when she's gone. So that's it getting into the sadness phase of it. And then this one, Lonesome, I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. So really interesting choice of songs for him. And also really interesting um, order of progression that he puts him on this album with originals uh, around him, you know, on all sides of it. He's got original songs on all sides of those three covers that he chose. A nice version of that song, just a very simple, very spare song, but it fits in with this album because of the message that he's singing throughout most of it. So, all right, eighth song, another one of the highlights for me is called The Glittering Prize. Uh, melodic soft rock start to this song. Uh, it's very, again, very John Waitey song, like the very first song on the album. Uh, musically, it just has this very clear, like very obvious John Wait sound to it. Like you would hear the song originally, you would hear it immediately come on the radio and know that that's going to be a John Wait song. Um, here on the Glittering Prize, he's acknowledging the breakup. Uh, he's even going so far as to say that he knew on their wedding day it was a mistake, which is like, ow, wow, that's that's a that's a tough pill to swallow. So he cuts loose a little bit more vocally here, which is always a plus for me. Like I said, I love the ballad side of John Wade and the mellow side, but he cuts loose a little bit on the rockin' her side here, rocking er side. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. Uh, so he cuts loose a little more vocally. Um, I just love this guy's voice, you know, and this is a great. Um, demonstration of how good his voice is um he does the harmonies here which is nice because <laughs> as somebody who loves john Waite's voice and doesn't hear enough of it um he's doing the lead as well as the harmonies here so it gives the listener even more john Waite, which is always appreciated so the glittering prize a really good song uh one of the highlights on the album at the eighth spot so ninth song is called more uh completely autobiographical song uh not much to it uh, he starts out talking about how he fell out of the sky in 1952, which I looked it up, and that is indeed when he was born. So gives you, obviously, that this is going to be from very, you know, the very beginning of the song tells you that this is going to be autobiographical. So uh, Moore has another song with a country vibe to it. Again, this is just him and an acoustic guitar, just an acoustic guitar, not a dobro, you know, don't want to be a complete insider here. So it's just him and an acoustic guitar. Uh, this is about a man seeking more from his life. He's confused. He's empty. Uh, he has a lot that he that he thinks about. You know, uh, he knows he has a lot, but it's fun. It's just one of those very metaphysical songs where he's searching for more meaning in his life than what he already has. So hence the name "More." He's searching for more out of his life. So this song, kind of there. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. So. And then finally, we wrap up the album with the 10th song, which is called In Dreams. And I'm like, In Dreams? I know I've heard this. You know, there's other, many other songs that have the word dreams in it. But I'm like, I know I've heard this. Let me see. I, I, and as soon as it came on, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the John Waite song. So it got some airplay. Um, it's an actual beautiful song. It's up there. For me, it's up there with Missing You as far as the, the beautiful John Waite type songs are. It's up there with Missing You. It's really good. And so I had totally forgotten. It was originally in Dreams. It was originally from the True Romance, True Romance soundtrack. 
uh, which came out in 1993, which is one of my, I guess I'm going to say one of my all time favorite movies, uh, it was written by Quentin Tarantino. It was the, the movie that kind of, it was up there in when Tarantino was first catching on. Um, it, came out in between Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. So, like, three years in a row, this guy did Reservoir Dogs, which he directed, and then in 93 came um, True Romance, which he wrote. He did not direct. And then in 94 was Pulp Fiction. So just an amazing run of success for Quentin Tarantino, which is such, such great stuff. So True Romance was, like, just, it hit me. It just was such a great movie. And I remember seeing it in a the theater. Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, uh, the usual suspects in the in the Quentin Tarantino movies, Brad Pitt already back then, Christopher Walken in this movie. So um, just such a great movie. And I remember that soundtrack was just, it fit. Just like the Tarantino movie soundtracks always work, this one worked. And In Dreams worked in this, in this soundtrack. So um, this is more, this has pretty much nothing to do with his divorce or anything like that, basically, because this song came out a couple years before this album. And they just, he obviously just tacked it on because it had gotten airplay from the soundtrack. And so he wanted to include it in a John Wade album proper. So this is definitely more from the perspective of Clarence and Alabama, who were the two lead characters in this movie, the lovers of the movie. Um, and he was so, Clarence was so taken with Alabama, the Patricia Arquette character. Um, he was just so taken with her. And as the movie went on, it became this violent you know, crazy cross country love story just with so many great elements to it and just all the traditional trappings of the Tarantino type movies. So the line that sticks out is the world out there can kiss my ass as long as I've got you, I'm free. So I'm like, it's just such a great line and it fit in with that movie. The lyric of the song fit in with everything about that movie and those two characters. Um, just a gorgeous song in dreams, just a gorgeous song. Um, it makes sense that he would totally add it on his next album after the True Romance soundtrack came out. Just such a great song. Fit in really well here, despite the fact that it had nothing to do with the, the theme of the rest of the album, which was the painful divorce that he had gone through. So great way to wrap up the album within Dreams. One Another one of the highlights. So I gotta say, great album. Um, the original songs on this are all very good. Uh, more was okay, but the rest of the uh, the rest of the original cuts on here were really good. Uh, very clever use of the covers in this context. Um, and again, like I said, I really appreciate both sides of John Wade. I appreciate the mellower side, which is most of what he's done since he left um, the bands, the rock bands that he was in. Uh, and I appreciate his rock stuff, you know, with either with the babies or with um, Bad English. So um, what's interesting is I was thinking back on the concerts that I've seen of him. And like I said, or with him, um, like I said, always very intimate, small clubs uh, because he's not going to pack giant arenas or anything, um, but always small places. So you can always hear conversation going on and people that are true fans of his. And you can always hear people talking about, you know, there's, there's people that are bigger fans than I am. I mean, I am the Fleetwood Mac guy. You know, if I'm in conversation and I can hold my own, you know, talking about the idiosyncrasies of Fleetwood Mac. That's my one band that I can always, I know I can always hold my own. But at a John Waite concert, there's definitely, especially women, that are way more into him than I am. And I'm into him. You know, I think he's a great singer. I think he's in my, you know, arguably in my Mount Rushmore of favorite singers, favorite male singers of all time. But there's women that are always massively, you know, knowledgeable about John Waite. And point I'm making is people would always be talking the, the couple times I've seen him, and it's been well since 1995, people had would always talk about Temple Bar, this album. And I, I never, I had it, you know, I didn't have it at the time. And I'm like, let me, I got to see, because the way people talk about this album, I got to find out what's so special about this album. And now I see it because, you know, they, they would like actually... You know, like I said, I'd see them in clubs that are like maybe two, three hundred people at the most, and people would literally yell out for songs on this album. They'd yell out for In Dreams for sure. Um, and now that I listen to it again, like I said, with a, a fresh set of ears, I really do appreciate how really good this album is. So now I get it why Temple Bar is this like, you know, this holy grail of John Waite music. So, um, but after his first few, like I said, his his first few solo albums, his after the hits kind of stopped coming, the radio hits stopped coming, 
his albums just flew under the radar. So, like I said, I'm going to go back. I'm going to start searching, whether it's used record stores or even if I can find stuff on Amazon or eBay, I'm going to find those last couple albums that I don't have uh, because there's got to be a treasure trove of great material by John Waite that I have not heard. And, it, you know, if I haven't heard that album, then that album is brand new to me. So it works for me. So that is it. Uh that is our celebration of the great John Waite. If I can get you to listen to anything by John Waite, at least, if nothing else, a Greatest Hits album, because, man, he's got so many great songs. And like I said, in the in the beginning, when I mentioned, you know, some of the other hits that he had, there's like those songs that you just forgot that he had that were him, you know. So go back and listen to some John Waite other than Missing You, which is, of course, a classic song. So anyway, thank you to Brian for producing this. Thank you to you, Record Store Nation, for listening and always sticking with us. We'll be back in a couple weeks. If you are a Patreon, stay tuned because you'll get to hear what my favorite song on the album was, which this is a tough one. i got to figure out because there's a lot of good songs to choose from on this album. So if you're a Patreon, you get to hear that and you get to hear the song in its entirety. If you're not a Patreon, think about joining because it helps support us and our efforts, our creative efforts on doing not only the wrestling but the music podcast. So join our Patreon. It is talked about at the end of the episode, so you'll find out how to join. Join us in a couple weeks. We'll be back with another episode of The Record Store, and we will talk to you soon. And don't forget, I have 